And our last but not least speaker is Dr. Thomas Kovacs, and he is a key member of the Center of a UCLA Research and Education, otherwise known as a Cure Hemostasis Research Group, and he'll address that pesky question of what is going on in the literature and on TV about PPIs. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction. It's the best one of the day so far. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and uh, especially for picking this prime slot as all of you are looking forward to lunch. Um, but I, I'd also like to apologize because I don't have amazing pictures like all the other um, presenters. I really just have lots of hysteria to share. Um, and, and this is one example here. Heartburn pills not safe after all, uh, linked to severe side effects. And that could come from the Washington Post, the New York Times, you know, the, the LA Times. It, it, it's, it's so prevalent these days. Um, for this audience, this is superfluous, but just as a reminder that the PPIs really have been available in the US uh, since the mid 80s and widely used. Uh, numbers uh, from 2009 or 10 <clears throat> include well over 113 million prescriptions, almost 14 billion in sales just in the US. They have been remarkably effective and safe, but recently, and by recently I expand that to the last several years, <clears throat> the side effects have been described, and this is becoming more of an important issue since really these drugs are used so frequently. Um, especially in the context of long-term um, PPI use, where we think of um, gastroesophageal reflux disease, Barrett's, as we heard earlier, prevention of upper GI injury related to NSAIDs, perhaps preventing uh, GI bleeding associated with antiplatelets, or even the un uncommon hypersecretory states are the usual situations where we consider using long-term uh, PPIs. And these, uh, again, are well known. What, what's clear is that there are multiple potential mechanisms for PPI side effects ranging from potentially changes in absorption uh, from vitamins and minerals and metabolic effects on bone density, drug interactions, infection risk, and hypersensitivity responses with end organ damage. And I'll try and touch briefly on some of these just to illustrate what, what's out there. Uh, early on, it was appreciated that gastric acid and calcium had important interactions, especially with potent acid suppression, and, and it's well known that dietary calcium absorption was mediated by gastric acid, uh, releasing ionized calcium from insoluble calcium. Uh, and it became clear that PPIs may impair calcium abs absorption, but despite what most of us thought, if you look clearly, there are at least two high quality studies show absolutely no adverse effects on calcium absorption and potent acid suppression with PPIs. The other thing that's important to remember is that soluble calcium absorption is, in, is unaffected by acid. And so that if one is aiming to supplement patients that may require cal calcium supplementation while they're on potent acid suppression. Calcium citrate is one example of a solu soluble calcium. More importantly has been the concern about PPI use and hip fractures, and some of this originated from a UK study published in, in JAMA in 2006, and you can see that although the hip fracture risk was low in patients uh, on PPI for greater than a year, the rates were still substantially higher in this study in, amongst uh, users than non-users. And more recently, um, a meta-analysis of, of 18 observational studies, and we'll come back to this notion of observational studies, showed that not only was hip fracture higher at about a 26% risk, but spine fractures and fractures at any site were substantially increased in PPI users. Again, observational studies. When you look at more focused, perhaps more appropriate studies, such as this US study uh, published in the BMJ, uh, BMJ of well over 80,000 female nurses who were followed prospectively, they were noted to have an increased hazard ratio of 1.36. But what became striking in this population was that, in fact, the risk, and I'll cut to the chase, is that the risk was seen only among smokers. 
not, not independent of the PPI effect. And so that quite clearly it's, it's known that smoking is linked to osteoporosis. And so that PPIs may only be, be a risk factor for fracture amongst patients at already at heightened risk. Well, what else? I think it's especially um, useful to know that when bone mineral density has been evaluated at baseline, during, and following up to 10 years of PPI treatment, there has been no acceleration noted in bone mineral density loss in PPI uh, users in comparison to non-users. And so that my take on this at the moment is that despite what seems to be popular uh, opinion, there's no good evidence to suggest that PPI use has a significant risk for bone density loss or fractures. What about uh, occasionally the situation of B12 and gastric acid comes up? I think this could be summarized quite briefly in that, yes, gastric acid may be important in releasing vitamin B12 from associated dietary proteins, uh, and then the B12 binds to the R protein, and then eventually intrinsic factor downstream to be uh, absorbed in the TI. Uh, but the studies to date, and I'll, I'll just try uh, cut to the chase, are at best conflicting. Uh, one study in elderly patients suggested that there was um, uh, an effect, and, and this was true for both H receptor antagonists and uh, proton pump inhibitors, whereas another uh, group of adults followed for up to seven years had absolutely no changes in their vitamin B12 levels on uh, acid suppressive therapy with PPIs. So again, I think that the, the jury is out uh, quite conflicting results so far. An area that's, that's quite interesting, although quite rare, is, is the effect of PPIs associated with hypomagnesemia. And based on an initial report of about 38 cases, the FDA, as you can see, issued a warning that prescription PPIs may cause low serum magnesium, uh, and this came out in March 2011. The other thing that was clear is that th this may be entirely asymptomatic. Uh, for those of us who aren't as familiar with magnesium balance, uh, in fact, it turns out that the level depends on, on, a, on a balance between both intestinal absorption and renal excretion, and that obviously then hypomagnesemia occurs either with decreased intestinal absorption or increased urinary loss. And when the patients with hypomagnesemia on PPIs were studied, it appeared clear that their renal excretion was normal, suggesting intestinal and intestinal absorption defect. But so far, the mechanism of how this occurs is unclear. The other thing that's, that does seem clear is that if you orally supplement, the, the, the levels increase. Um, just a brief overview of some of the, of what's, what we know about this condition is that it, it seems to occur after at least a year uh, on the, on the uh, proton pump inhibitors. All the PPIs have, have been associated. It doesn't seem to be dose dependent. And interestingly, other metabolic defects related to magnesium function, such as hypokalemia or hypocalcemia, also occur. Interesting features have been identified both on exam and, and um, EKG abnormalities. Uh, but I think the important thing is that the symptoms resolve and magnesium normalizes promptly with oral supplementation, like with magnesium oxide, and stopping the proton pump inhibitor. Um, and then just remember that, that clearly there are other etiologies potentially for low magnesium. Are there any guidelines? Well, it doesn't seem clear. The FDA, in its wisdom, suggests that checking a baseline magnesium in patients about to start a proton pump inhibitor and consider periodic monitoring on PPIs. So, I mean, that's completely unpractical. You think someone's going to get OTC uh, omeprazole, they're, they're not going to need or get a, a magnesium level. But I think perhaps in select patients, the elderly, maybe those with underlying cardiac uh, morbidity or on di diuretics, it would be appropriate to consider screening them and then following. And the other thing I'd like to emphasize is this is extremely rare, <clears throat> but I think as with any of these potential effects, important to be uh, aware of the possibility. Another area of interest, excitement, hysteria has included um, the effect of PPIs in enteric infection, mainly because, as I, most of us appreciate, uh, 
that uh, gastric acid uh, or acidity has been felt to, to have a bactericidal effect and that this happens to be quite prompt. A gastric pH above four increases the susceptibility to a variety of microbes and, and allowing perhaps up to 50% of ingested uh, bacteria to survive the gastric trap. It, it's curious that the threshold target, for instance, for gastroesophageal reflux disease, a pH above four, happens to be the watershed uh, line actually for acquisition of a variety of enteric infections. What about C. diff? C. diff is probably the best studied of these enteric infections and has been associated potentially with proton pump inhibitor use. Two forms of C. diff, as I think we all know, one's acid sensitive and there's an acid resistance spore. Uh, both occur in the feces, the vegetative for, uh, form about tenfold greater than the spores. What's interesting is that in either vitro and, and in animal studies, the vegetative cells do not survive normal gastric acidity. It's the spores, however, that can survive in the low gastric pH and pass into the small bowel and then germinate, liberating the toxigenic vegetative forms. Um, the vegetative forms theoretically could survive in gastric contents at a pH greater than five, leading to colonization of susceptible hosts. Now, again, we all, all know that antibiotics are the most common risk factor for C. diff-associated diarrhea. Um, the thinking being that normal gut microbes would be altered, you eliminate the homeostatic influence of the floor and allow C. diff growth. Um, the combination of antibiotics and the proton pump inhibitors may therefore be additive to increase the C. diff susceptibility. And what's curious and what's, what's interesting is that in fact PPIs on their own have been suggested over a relatively short time to alter gut flora, perhaps rendering it more C. diff friendly. Um, and for those of you that are interested in that, there's a recent st uh, study published last October and November in Gastro talking about that. So doses of omeprazole is uh, 40 milligrams twice a day for up to four weeks produced changes in some healthy volunteers uh, that were reversible with the PPI uh, being stopped. Um, what happens in terms of PPIs and, and C. diff? Well, again, the studies are all over, and you can see that, uh, and for instance, one, one compilation of 27 studies, um, 17 showed that there was an association between PPI use, um, 10 studies showed no association, and then there was this, uh, a further subgrouping suggesting that there might be an association between PPI use and recurrent C. diff. Uh, the most recent giant meta-analysis of 39 studies suggesting it suggested a 74% risk, higher risk of developing C, uh, C. diff infection if you were on a PPI, and a two and a half fold greater chance of developing recurrent C. diff if you were on a PPI. And it's that kind of info that led the FDA to uh, provide a safety alert in last year, actually warning of the association. And so my, I would caution all of us to be aware of this association and that perhaps in a patient with long, who's on a longstanding PPI, uh, who develops diarrhea, especially if it's severe, to consider stopping the PPI and checking for C. diff. But beyond that, I'm not sure that there's any other specific recommendations. I put pneumonia and PPIs here because that, that also was one of the original infectious issues. I think it's important to see that um, when well-done studies were reported, there is no association. Here's one reported in gut 2014 um, showing that, that when confounding factors were corrected, there is no association between community-associated pneumonia and use of proton pump inhibitors. Here, I think um, there was a huge publicity generated a few years ago about the interaction between clopidogrel or Plavix and, and um, proton pump inhibitor use. Again, uh, if we think uh, the, the proton pump inhibitors are widely used, as you can see, Plavix is the second leading prescription drug worldwide with, with sales of up almost nine billion. Um, the studies initially described uh, an interaction between PPI and clopidogrel that led to increased cardiovascular events such as coronary artery stent thrombosis and myocardial infarction when the two agents were used together. 
Um, clopidogrel is widely used, multiple indications as you can see. Um, but the important thing in terms of why there may be an issue is that clopidogrel is an inactive prodrug that needs to be converted to its active metabolite. And, it, and this conversion occurs actually through the C450 enzyme system. And eventually that produces an active, active agent that, leads, that irreversibly binds to the platelet receptor. Um, in the absence of PPIs, there are interesting genetic models that have been shown to affect clopidogrel metabolism. Um, and that's mentioned at the bottom uh, of, this, of the, uh, the slide. But what's curious is that, in fact, there has been, or there's a plausible interaction between the proton pump inhibitors, which are also metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system. And the PPIs may, therefore, competitively uh, inhibit the conversion of clopidogrel to its active metabolite, thereby leading to less effect of the clopidogrel and potentially greater uh, occurrence of cardiovascular issues. And you can see that at least in, in the uh, lab situation, omeprazole and lansoprazole have, have been shown to be the most potent inhibitors, whereas pantoprazole and rebeprazole are the least potent inhibitors. Is there an interaction? Well, in the lab, in vitro studies suggest there is. And initial studies suggested that there was a substantial interaction between clopidogrel and PPI users, so that there was a 30% increased risk of cardiovascular events in comparison to non-users. But what's interesting and reassuring is that none of the subsequent four randomized clinical trials have found an increased risk of cardio cardiovascular events amongst patients on clopidogrel and omeprazole or esomeprazole. So yes, there's observational studies, but no clinical, randomized clinical trials suggesting an interaction. The FDA, I think all of you know, eventually, with the initial results, warned against the concomitant use of clopidogrel with omeprazole and esomeprazole. And then the question is, even these days, we get this from the cardiologists or some of the primary care physicians, what to do with the co-therapy? Um, I think it's clear that the risk on cardiovascular outcomes has been exaggerated. And if people need uh, to be on clopidogrel and acid suppression, such as let's say they're on co-therapy with aspirin and they've had prior ulcers or bleeding or they're, uh, they're on anticoagulants or NSAIDs, the agents should be prescribed together. I think that despite FDA-specific FDA uh, recommendations, there is at the moment no evidence to suggest that any PPI is optimal in this circumstance. Um, is there anything else you can do? Well, there's been talk that based on the different pharmacodynamics of these agents, one could try and separate when, when you administer uh, the agents so that PPIs could be taken before meals, uh, clopidogrel in the evening so that there's no interaction. And the other thing that's clear is that there are newer antiplatelet agents available or will be shortly. So this should be less of an issue. All right, well, clopidogrel, PPIs, the heart, Crazy. At, at the end of last year, in fact, came another uh, study uh, that I think highlights some of the hysteria that's been ongoing. So some heartburn drugs may boost the risk of heart attack, the study finds. And so the question was going to be, do these medications cause angina, heart, heart attacks, or is that just basically just heartburn? Um, a dramatic study was reported in this journal that I'm not so familiar with, PLOS One, uh, last year. Uh, and it was a giant study using the te technique that's called data mining. And the PPIs in that study were shown uh, to be associated with myocardial infarctions across the age range in patients independent of clopidogrel and with an odds ratio of 1.16. And there was no association in this data mining set with H receptor antagonists. Um, but this flew in the, uh, completely against uh, conventional either wisdom or prior studies, as you can see, and practice guidelines such as the American Heart Association or the American College of Cardiology, 
And the other important thing with any of these huge studies, observational, is that the study truly can only establish an association, not a causal relationship. And so in this case, as in others, the PPI use may in fact just be a surrogate marker for sicker patients, and uh, so that perhaps increased gastroesophageal reflux disease prevalence in patients with obesity, smoking, or diabetes all may increase the risk uh, for myocardial infarction. And this is one of the best illustrations of, of uh, PPI use in an observational study. Here's a giant women's health in initiative, almost 100,000 uh, people studied. In this study, PPI users had poor health, a higher prevalence of angina and arthritis, and a positive association with obesity, and probably cigarette smoking and, and, and alcohol use. And so that although uh, these observational studies may be much larger than randomized controlled trials, they're prone to this selection bias and confounding, which truly are minimized by, ra by appropriate randomization. So the, these are further uh, illustrations of observational studies showing that PPI use can cause other issues. Their short-term kidney damage uh, was found, interstitial nephritis being one potential cause, and there, there may be some, some background for that, which we can talk about later. Recently, again, in, in JAMA, uh, this year, early this year, the concern about um, almost uh, well over 10,000 patients followed 50% higher risk of chronic kidney disease in PPI users. Again, the notion being that acute kidney disease via, via interstitial nephritis or um, hypomagnesemia may be the effect. But again, these are observational studies where the PPIs may themselves be surrogate markers for something else, and truly further studies are needed. Here, um, I think the, the, I don't know what, what goes beyond hysteria, perhaps hysterical paranoia, uh, recently out, in the last three, four weeks, and so this is well-timed, uh, at least as, uh, to bring this up, popular heartburn drugs linked to risk of dementia. Why you need to be worried about the PPI dementia risk? PPIs may hike dementia risk in the elderly. This came out of a, a large German study based on an insurance database showing that in PPI users, the risk, the hazard ratio went up to 1.44. Um, what, what the authors didn't disclose as carefully is that use of this kind of database really restricted the quality uh, of the diagnosis and even what kind of dementia. And what became clear is this, in this elderly patient population, polypharmacy was rampant. So polypharmacy, taking at least five or six drugs, which on its own was found to be a, an independent risk factor for, de uh, for dementia. So again, although this is intriguing, further studies are needed to really evaluate the PPI use, especially long-term, um, and, and uh, this co-occurrence with dementia. Um, the one, one tremendously reassuring, uh, it's, it's a long-term observation uh, study, comes from this, recently published uh, in, in the uh, APT. And all of you are probably familiar with this study. We've seen them in early, short, medium, long-term studies, the LOTUS and, and, and the SOPRAN trials that looked at PPI versus reflux procedure. And this comes from, from Europe, predominantly from, from Sweden and the Karolinska. And you can see that for patients followed in a controlled, randomized type situation for five and 12 years, whether it's omeprazole, up to 40 milligrams twice a day, isomeprazole, 40 milligrams, 40 milligrams twice a day, absolutely no major safety concerns during this five to 12 years of continuous PPI therapy. So in summary, obviously we need to balance the risk and the benefit of PPI therapy. They've revolutionized the management of acid-related diseases. Um, I just emphasize or mention again that any of these potential adverse effects uh, most of the data is based on observational studies and with its own uh, intrinsic difficulties such as bias and confounding. Um, is there anything specific now versus in the past? Well, I think this would be the same five or almost ten years ago. Really, we only should use PPIs if there's an appropriate indication. Compliance should be assessed if symptoms persist. When are they taking it? Are they taking it? Are they taking it at bedtime versus an appropriate time? <coughs> 
Adjunctive uh, measures in terms of pH monitoring should be used to help guide uh, the therapy. Um, clearly, we should be using the, the medications at their lowest effective dose. And the increased risk of adverse outcomes is usually with high daily doses. And so potentially we could use or consider on-demand therapy for uncomplicated reflux disease. And again, important to remember that for most of these, except for infection, uh, the adverse events occurred in patients on long-term therapy. Is there anything that we could do? Well, as I mentioned, potentially uh, calcium supplementation for those p patients in whom it's appropriate. Again, thinking of, of soluble calcium salt like cal uh, calcium citrate. Avoiding PPIs potentially for non-urgent conditions if people are traveling to areas uh, where there's enteric infection risk is high. And potentially even limiting NSAID exposure in elderly patients. Thank you very much for your attention.